Neil Metcalf. Um, I'm delighted that Neil can join us. As, as you're probably aware, we had to rearrange this talk because uh, Richard, actually, sorry, Neil was actually struck down by COVID very shortly before his last talk. And although he was actually quite breathless with it, was still uh, very stoically keen to give the talk, despite the fact he couldn't actually talk in complete sentences. So I'm terribly impressed with his uh, stoicism, uh, not so impressed with his foolhardiness, but um, we were del mm -hmm. delighted that um, we were able to uh, make some changes and accommodate uh, Neil now that he has uh, almost fully recovered. Um, so by way of introduction, Neil, uh, amongst a lot of other qualifications, is an FRCPP. He's a full-time GP partner in Stillington. He's been so for 18 months. Stillington, as most of you will know, was a lovely village just north of York, just by the Hawardian Hills. It's a beautiful part of the world to live and to practice medicine. Um, he's widely published um, in both medical and medical history fields. Uh, and runs medical history undergraduate courses at several medical schools. Um, he edited and part wrote a hundred notable names from general practice, uh, which was published by CRC Press in 2019, uh, and upon which this presentation tonight is based. So uh, with no further ado, over to, me, over to you, Neil. Okay. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you for everyone joining. Uh, good to see so many faces. This is my first test of Zoom, so share the slides. There we go. Hopefully that's working. Okay, just a few more buttons. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, 100 notable names from general practice and... Uh, perhaps I'll start off by saying you may be happy to hear that they won't be all 100 uh, because that would certainly go through a bit too fast and uh, for some uh, cause too much sleep perhaps. Um, it is, as, I, as, as you heard, uh, a book that I did and there'll be just a small discussion about it at the beginning um, to say why I came across it. Um, so next slide. Practice, but not necessarily all of them. There we go. Um, so just a bit about the background to it. Um, as you've heard, I have done a bit of history of medicine, very amateur uh, interest. Um, but some of my publications I've done before did include uh, biographies. So I was aware of some of the sources of biographies. And it just seemed that GPs were never really uh, figuring. There's the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, which has over 60,000 entries, of which 3,200 or more were on doctors. And the ratio uh, or the percentage of GPs figuring in it was uh, just over 1%. There's the Dictionary of Medical Biography, which is five volumes of medical biographies uh, of doctors all around the world. Um, and that has a, uh, 1,140 entries and GPs focused in 1.5%. And, and there's also a Journal of Medical Biography, which has over 1,600 entries and GP for, uh, was involved in half a percent. So between half and one and a half percent of the main sources of medical biography had GPs in it. And I just thought, mm, uh, perhaps that should be a bit higher, especially from the point of view of, uh, this is not a historical bit of data, but in 2016, 43% were uh, GPs in the UK. In terms of Europe, there was a study in 2013 saying 30% were, were GPs. So I haven't gone back to see how over hundreds of years what the percentage is, but linking that to the fact that there's not too many biographies, again, I thought, hmm, maybe do a book on uh, general practice biographies. And there's three books on the history of general practice, none of which uh, had uh, biography as one of the sources of medical research. Uh, in terms of the book, I, thought I decided to try and include uh, the whole spectrum of time for general practice. And you'll hear shortly that this starts in 1704 and I went to the modern day. In terms of who, who to include, uh, I was assisted by the fact that Pulse about 2010, 2011, did a, um, a bit of uh, asking around of eminent GPs and doctors about who should feature uh, if ever there were to be a book like this. 
Uh, so it had the 50 most notable names along that line. Uh, so I used partly that information. Um, I was in touch with the RCGP um, Heritage Committee. I also got in touch with the RCGP um, parts of the uh, UK, like the Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, etc., for suggestions. Uh, and there was just a few people who I'd come across in time uh, who I knew weren't that well known about. Um, but I was, I was aware that there might be some discussions about uh, why, why wasn't my granddad included and all these sort of things, but I had to uh, stick to my guns and uh, explain, uh, explain in the introduction. Um, I, I was starting to do it all by myself, but I realized it was too much work in the end. Um, so I ended up asking for some contributions and there were archivists, librarians, GPs, medical historians and medical students as well uh, who uh, contributed. Uh, I wrote it in chronological order generally, uh, which is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to spend about 45 minutes uh, or so because that was what I was told. Uh, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to get all 100 in, so I might just quicken up towards the end of the ones that I still wanted to mention. So it starts off by talking about GPs uh, from before the uh, 20th century. And this is the era when very much there was the tripartite system. Uh, the physicians had been um, the ones at the top of the tree because of the university degrees and they uh, uh, diagnosed and then prescribed the physic. Um, and they were Royal College from King Henry VIII's time. The, uh, the surgeons had been linked with the bar barbers uh, and then around about 1740 or so uh, had separated and they'd become a royal college in 1800. But there was also the apothecaries and they were the ones who uh, prescribed, um, made the medicine uh, that was being uh, suggested by the uh, physicians. Or summary of that there actually. Um, and so when we move to the beginning of the uh, 18th century, um, there was uh, quite a lot of um, issues with the physicians and the apothecaries. Uh, the physicians weren't that keen on hearing that the apothecaries kept on um, trying to diagnose as well as prescribe. Uh, they thought that their reputation was going to be affected as well as uh, losing income. Um, so there are a few clashes. William Rose was an apothecary and his family were from uh, a Jamaican uh, uh, colonists. So he was actually quite rich for a, uh, for a apothecary at the time and he was quite well known. Um, and so he went to see a William uh, Searle who was a butcher and he diagnosed his uh, sexual uh, transmitted disease and also did the prescription. Uh, Mr. Searle wasn't that impressed, partly by the fact that he didn't get better, but also by the signs of the bill that came his way. So he let the uh, Royal College of Physicians know about it, who were already keen to uh, get after Rose. And they, they um, went to, uh, to the King's Bench and uh, Rose was fined uh, because he was um, diagnosing as well as prescribing. But some members of the uh, jury weren't that... Uh, uh, supportive of uh, the Royal College of Physicians and did think that Rose had a point and it all le uh, lent to a retrial which uh, he was supported by the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries um, and they won and um, in the history of general practice this this time has been put down as when uh, general practitioners were given the license to actually do general practice by both diagnosing and treating uh, and making the actual uh, medicines. And it was about 10 years later that the first term uh, general practitioner was mentioned. So it's partly all to do with the Rose case uh, was why he got mentioned. I do zoom forward about 100 years or so to George Manborough's uh, more unrest in the medical profession at the time. Uh, because there were so many um, surgeon apothecaries or apothecaries or general practitioners, the, the terms are quite interchangeable. Um, there was also quite a difference in quality and virtually anybody could say that they were a, uh, a, a GP. And so people like Burroughs were, were not too keen on uh, being associated with those who may be uh, not doing as well. There's also a glass, task, uh, sorry, a glass tax at the time. Uh, so a few of the GPs were up in arms about all these things. And so Burroughs, uh, it was at a pub uh, in the Strand um, formed the London Association of Apothecaries, something that he later regretted by the fact that he had something like 1500 letters of correspondence over three, three years um, at various uh, meetings taking up his time. 
but it all led to the Apothecaries Act, which I'm just going to go on to the next slide as well, because someone else did help him. Uh, George Burroughs's son uh, was a uh, was later to be one of the uh, presidents of the BMA and also physician to the uh, Queen Victoria. But I, I'm mentioning Robert Masters Kerrison at the same time because he, he was also a member of the society. Uh, he was the editor of the journal of the, uh, the society, but he also did a lot of campaigning with the MPs, uh, trying to explain what, what their views are and trying to, uh, to get an act out of it. Um, and it did lead to the Apothecaries Act of the 1st of August, 1815, and I've written it here. Uh, it, it caused all apothecaries, GPs, to be licensed to be at least 21 years of age and pass an examination. This was all done by the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries who suddenly had a lot more uh, work to be doing, uh, keeping this license. Um, over time, the license in, uh, sort of improved in level. 1827, midwifery and diseases of women and children were added. 1834, you had to pass an examination at the end of training and do a formal testimonial. And there's a medical paper in 1839. Later on, there was some Greek, uh, Latin and maths as well. Uh, it had mixed successes, but uh, just mentioning that. Away from that, uh, I mentioned Anthony Todd Thompson. He uh, was very much involved in botany and dermatology, but also had a GP practice at the same time. He did a um, he did a encyclopedia, all to do with uh, the uh, botany at the time. It went to fourteen editions. Uh, he would often take medical students uh, to uh, to the uh, royal gardens, Kew Gardens. Um, he he gets also mentioned because he um, he was involved in the uh, in, in research uh, in in writing, but also. It's, it's not that important, but I quite like this spoon. Um, it's actually known as a Gibson spoon. Uh, he created it, did uh, Thompson, because it all had it had a special lumen in it, which allowed patients, particularly mental health patients, to actually control how much was going into them in terms of speed. And it was thought to increase the uh, acceptance of patients to, to be able to control it rather than just getting things shoved, shoved into them. It's called a Gibson spoon because the silversmith was uh, Gibson. So Thompson lost out a little bit on that, but uh, it was Thompson who created it. I just liked it when I did the book uh, about that bit. Um, someone perhaps a bit more well-known, Thomas Wakeley. Um, he was uh, someone who wasn't very keen on nepotism in, uh, in the medical world. At medical school, uh, there was various people getting pushed ahead of him because of uh, finances that they had or family links uh, and the same happened in his early uh, career. Uh, so I mentioned that because I'm going to go back to it. Uh, he was a little bit lucky though in that he married into uh, into wealth and his father-in-law then actually paid for his actual his first uh, GP practice. It was um, in the west end of London. Um, so uh, nepotism he sort of forgot about on that occasion. But he, his practice was doing quite well. He was never going to be high ranking uh, because of um, what I've said earlier. Um, he wasn't going to get given the, high, you know, the, the best places. But what happened was um, there was Arthur Thistlewood, who, whose gang at the time were involved in conspiring, conspiring to, uh, to murder various MPs and judges. They were caught and um, they were executed. And um, the newspapers, uh, uh, when reporting the, uh, the executions, said, oh, these are very impressive executions. Uh, they must have very good surgical skill to know how cleanly to cut through the neck and everything. Um, and this gentleman looks, uh, looks young. Obviously, the, the uh, face wasn't known. But because uh, Wakeley's practice on Argyle Street was, was the nearest to it, it was assumed that it was probably him who was the, execu uh, the executioner. About three months later, his building was burnt down and he was attacked. And it was, it was always thought to be uh, some of the remnants of uh, Thistlewood's gang. So his GP practice went, uh, went down. And because of insurance issues, it took quite some time to get his money. So his medical practice faded away. He did restart again. Uh, but during this time, he became friends with, uh, with a William Cobbett who was uh, an MP for Coventry, but he also had his own uh, political newspapers and journals. Um, I think it was Cobbett's Weekly Political Politics, for example. Um, and by seeing how he got his messages across, it gave Wakeley the idea to actually do one uh, about his own medical views. 
very much about nepotism and making sure that all had access to medical knowledge. So he ended up creating the Lancet, uh, which came out in 1823 for sixpence. And because he was a very uh, uh, strong writer and uh, had his views, um, it got quite popular very quickly. He went to all the lectures and uh, especially of these surgeons who were, who were giving places to their you know, god children and, and everything. And he published them. So he got in a bit of trouble because of copyright, but uh, he didn't mind paying a few fines uh, just to uh, get one up on them. And uh, by the 1870s, it was the most, it had been the most popular medical journal in the UK. But from 1870s onwards, uh, the BMJ uh, took over in terms of sales. So uh, that was Thomas Wakeley, a GP, who uh, helped start the Lancet. Um, just mention Robert Rainey Pennington. Um, he was a gentleman who did very well financially as a GP. Uh, at the time in London, the average was about £2,000 per year, and he was getting £10,000. But he, he did work very hard uh, with uh, getting up at six to do visits and working all the way till midnight. Um, and uh, But his... But any celebrity of the time or MP or cabinet minister that he was basically their GP uh, but he got mentioned not because of that it's because he was the first person who uh, suggested an actual association of GPs and to, to do it around the whole country um, they, were, they didn't ever come to fruition um, there were some offshoots that, were, that, that included creating the BMA for example uh, but uh, he got mentioned mainly because of that a hundred years before the RCGP got created, he was uh, he was making suggestions along those lines. Oops. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few people more for their um, uh, research and work. Uh, go back in a bit of time to John Huxham. Uh, he was from Plymouth. He he also married into a wealthy family, uh, and when he did so, he then very much took on uh, the air of a gentleman uh, with his ruffled coats. He had a gold-topped cane. Um, he uh, had a footman to carry his gloves uh, to be used when seeing patients. He also made up patients, so he'd be at church and then get these uh, uh, made up messages to go and see someone of high ranking just to improve his, uh, his uh, position uh, amongst the medical world. But he uh, it, it, it did do some good research. He, he took on the Royal Society uh, suggestion to look into uh, weather um, mapping and over 20, 30 years, he, he got loads of recordings, which were very useful for the uh, meteorological world. Similar time, he was also doing research or note, uh, jotting down treatments and coming up with things to do with fevers, such that he wrote a book about fevers and uh, Queen Mariana Victoria of Spain, um, her doctors used this book and he was cited as very much improving her health King Joseph I of Portugal, who was a husband, was so impressed that he made sure that all the books were, well, his book was turned into uh, Portuguese and um, uh, sent Huxham a gold copy of it. Uh, he also did research in, in influenza and was one of the early ones who advocated uh, fruit for scurvy, although I know his name's not linked to it uh, historically, but he, he had already started uh, using fruit with all the sailors that he came across in, uh, in Plymouth. Someone I'm sure everyone's heard of, Edward Jenner, and also very apt with the uh, current world. Uh, he was a GP in Gloucestershire. Um, he did go to the John Hunter uh, School of Medicine in London and uh, became very friendly uh, from a correspondence point of view as well uh, with Hunter. Um, and I mentioned that because um, Hunter always uh, encouraged him to do as much research as possible. He said things like, why think, just do the experiment. And he, uh, he gave Jenner a thermometer, which in those days was very expensive. He used a the thermometer to do very, very important research on the uh, um, hibernation patterns of hedgehogs. Um, he also did about the life cycle of the eel. Um, he also did about, uh, I think, the life cycle of cuckoos and various other birds. Um, but it was, it was to do with obviously uh, vaccination that he became famous for. In his area, it was known or thought of that if you got cowpox, you hardly ever got uh, smallpox. So he, uh, there's an eight-year-old boy called James Phipps who, uh, who he took the um, uh, uh, cowpox blister from a local milkmaid called Sarah Nelms and gave it to Phipps. 
uh, he then gave smallpox to Phipps, who didn't get smallpox. So this was published. Uh, it received mixed uh, reviews initially. There was the unchristian argument saying, uh, why involve animals? There was also uh, some cross-contamination sometimes between cowpox and smallpox, leading to smallpox being given to people. Um, uh, but over time, uh, it was obviously accepted. Uh, he didn't finish his career as a GP. Uh, you were allowed to buy a degree in those days. Uh, and even though he never went to Scotland, he did actually buy a degree from St Andrews and he ended up his latter career being a, a physician. But he's very much known as the man who has uh, saved the most lives uh, in the history of humanity. Um, and obviously with the COVID at the moment, uh, uh, his, his work has potentially uh, started that back in uh, 1796. So he got a mention. Uh, James Parkinson, uh, his dad was a GP in Shoreditch and eventually uh, James Parkinson did join him in partnership. Apparently they, they had a very busy uh, practice that did very well. Uh, Parkinson was, had various views and did lots of writing uh, on pacifism. Um, also he had a big fossil interest, which I will mention a little bit later. Uh, but obviously, uh, it was when he started writing and noting six cases, he wrote it in about 65 pages over five volumes. A, there seems to be some people with a, with a tremor at rest who, um, who bend over uh, when walking and also go from a walking to running gait. Uh, and he wrote it all up. Um, it wasn't known as Parkinson's disease at the time. Uh, it was actually Jean-Martin Charcot about 30 years after Parkinson's death, who then uh, linked Parkinson's work with it and has always been called Parkinson's disease since. But yeah, Parkinson, he, he was a GP in Shoreditch. Um, here's why he gets a mention. Um, just move to John Abercrombie. He was, uh, he was from Aberdeen, uh, but was a very well-known GP in Edinburgh. In fact, he, where he worked from was the, um, next to the Edinburgh Riding School, and it has now actually become the Royal College of Surgeons uh, building in Edinburgh. Um, he did do some surgical work as well uh, as, as his GP clinic. And he was the first uh, writer uh, of neuropathology when he wrote pathological and practical researches on diseases of the spinal cord. He was also the first person who uh, realized what duodenal ulcers were um, and later became physician to King George IV. So he did have a, he did a bit of everything, did, did Abercrombie, but he did start off as a GP. Um, that's why he gets a mention. Uh, Jacob Augustus Lockhart Clark. Um, testing my neuroanatomy a little bit, he did uh, when writing about him. He, uh, he was known to be lazy by his family, but he certainly wasn't in later life. Um, he, he just very much um, enjoyed research, uh, especially histology. And he actually came up with a staining technique, which was used for quite a number of years. Uh, and that was well published. It had various strengths of wine for a certain amount of time and various oils added in. But he, he just went, he did his GP work and then at, in, at the night did research uh, on his histology specimens. And he was the first one who uh, noted what the dorsal nucleus of the spinal cord is, which is named after him as Clark's nucleus. He also described the posterior vesic vesicular column. He did lots of work on various diseases. Um, I haven't put them all here, but uh, he also was one of the early ones to do work on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, but yes, uh, a bit of a GP with histology and neuroanatomy uh, involved. Um, William Budd, uh, he uh, was very much involved in typhoid work. He, he was from a family of, uh, of 10 children. Uh, him and his five brothers all became doctors. His dad was also a GP, uh, a GP from North Towton in Devon. Uh, and Bud came across typhoid a number of times. He had a period of time working in France, I think in the 1820s or late, late 20s, early 30s, uh, with an eminent French doctor. And there was a typhoid epidemic then. And he got thinking about it. He went back to work in Devon uh, with his dad. Uh, and there's another typhoid outbreak. And he came across the idea of could it be all from water? He had a spell on HMS Dreadnought as well, I should say. Uh, he got typhoid himself, uh, so that ended up uh, not a very long spell. 
But it was when he went to um, Bristol to work as a GP, he worked in the Clifton area and um, he noted that on a certain road, I think it was Richmond Street in Clifton, um, about 11 of the houses had, had typhoid, but why didn't the other 30 or so uh, not? And it was him who realised that those 11 houses were all using the same well compared with the, the other houses in the street. Uh, so he pub published it or tried publishing it initially uh, through a prize. He didn't win the prize. People didn't believe him. Uh, so it took a number of years for him to be uh, to be accepted. Um, but yes, uh, he was credited with uh, helping discover typhoid. He did similar work uh, on cholera, uh, but it was beaten to publication by a month uh, on that one by John Snow. Now, we should be quite proud of him uh, as York Medical Society, as he was a York man. He was born on North Street. He went to St. Peter's School um, and then he was in the first year at, oh, that Newcastle Medical School was created. Um, he had spells working up in uh, Sunderland, uh, where he came across a cholera uh, outbreak. Uh, he also worked in Pateley Bridge. Um, what I was quite impressed with him uh, was when I heard how how keen he was to continue his work and research. He walked all the way from York to London uh, to, to enrol on further medical courses. He ended up settling uh, in the Soho area and around about 1848, there was a cholera epidemic. I, he just noted um, that, um, oh, not, not 1848, uh, hmm, might have been, sorry, um, that, um, when the local waterworks had um, had moved uh, where they were getting the supply from higher up uh, the river, there seemed to be a reduced amount of uh, cholera in that. It got him thinking. When there was an epidemic, it was 1854, um, that um, uh, there's an outbreak, and he decided to to write on the map where everybody was getting it and seeing if there was a link. So he put all the crosses on his map. And he thought it was all coming from a pump on Broad Street that was no doubt heard of. Uh, so he got permission from the local council uh, to prime it or stop the pump. And suddenly the cholera uh, disappeared. And that led to um, much work on it and publications. I hope I've got the dates there. Uh, I don't know if I've written that down right. Um, but he was, a, he was a very good man in terms of other work. Quite a lot of my history of anesthesia work uh, was around this time because uh, ether came to the United Kingdom in 1846 and chloroform came in um, 1847 uh, and Snow very much quickly took on uh, this new thing from America. Uh, he designed various masks that were, were, were uh, um, made and uh, transported around the country and he, he was invited to be the anaesthetist to Queen Victoria uh, when she delivered Prince uh, Leopold in 1853 and Princess Beatrice, I think, in 1857. At the time, anaesthesia wasn't fully uh, being accepted because, uh, because of religious arguments about Eve wasn't in, uh, was in pain, so uh, that's what uh, ladies and labour was for uh, in terms of, a, of pain or not pain. Um, but if Queen Victoria has the has anaesthetic and she's head of the Church of England, then surely uh, surely it's okay. So uh, it did help accept anaesthesia a lot more by by the medical and the public. Um, anyway, I digress because I quite like talking about the history of anaesthetics. Uh, but that was no, and he was voted in two thousand two two thousand three uh, by UK doctors uh, to have been the uh, most influential. Uh, and greatest uh, doctor that we have uh, ever produced. Someone who probably isn't as well known, um, but Charles Harrison Blakely. Um, he originally was a printer, but he ended up uh, going back to study medicine. He, he had hay fever. Uh, hay fever was known from about 1821 as a condition, but it wasn't known what the cause was. So he did a lot of experiments on himself. Uh, he got about 80 different plants and, uh, and flowers, uh, and he was the first one to do uh, skin, uh, skin prick testing, uh, but he'd also inhale it as well and decide uh, which one was worse, for example. Um, but it was him who, who, who got the link with pollen, partly by doing this, but people weren't believing the pollen idea because they said, oh, why do all these people in inner cities uh, get hay fever. There's, there's no flowers around. Um, so partly because of his correspondence with Charles Darwin, 
he he had his own balloons uh, that he'd put high up into the atmosphere. They'd have a timer on it. They had some sort of sticky tape on it, and he'd measure the levels of pollen in the atmosphere uh, at different heights. And by showing that pollen was able to be transported at 2,000 meters uh, and like uh, in the air and travel great distances, he was able to uh, to uh, link that pollen indeed was the uh, cause of hay fever um, and uh, got it got it published and he, he was known as the, as the father of that. He did do quite a lot of um, work on uh, other topics as well uh, but yeah it's it was with hay fever that he got linked and that was Charles Blakely. Um, but yeah um, another father of a branch of medicine, uh, Hugh Owen Thomas, his family had always been bone setters but his father was very keen on his own children uh, getting a medical degree because he, he was limited by what he could do uh, or wanted to do. So Hugh Owen Thomas, he did go to medical school. He went back to work near the family in Liverpool. Um, there was a lot of work to do because of the docks and the amount of uh, accidents that he'd come across. But he very much detested how the, uh, the, the richer surgeons at the time always turned down doing work with the poor. Uh, there was a lot of TB as well, causing uh, issues with children. But Thomas, he 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 treated all patients. Uh, again, very well known for his work ethic, but particularly working with the poor. He he came up with uh, with the uh, Thomas splint, uh, two rigid rods attached to um, to uh, an apparatus around the thigh. He also came up with what was named the Thomas test, uh, looking for fixed flexion deformities of the hip. Um, but he also did suffer a little bit by not really being recognised by the rest of the country. Uh, a GP from, from Liverpool uh, wasn't going to be winning many arguments about certain conditions, particularly about small bowel obstruction was, was the main one uh, with high eminent surgeons over in, uh, in London. But after he died, a um, good 20, 30 years later, work that he was doing also on small bowel obstruction was taken to actually have been correct. Um, and because his nephew had seen him in action and had learnt a bit from him as well, when his nephew was working the First World War as a doctor and with the amount of thigh and leg injuries, he used his uncle's techniques and this very much popularised at last uh, the work that uh, Hugh uh, Owen Thomas had done. Uh, so with the amount of work that happened in the First World War, they realised, yeah, Thomas uh, had been a... Uh, a leader and he is, he is known as the father of British orthopaedics. He, um, his funeral apparently, there was thousands of people came out to his funeral because of the work that he had done with the poor uh, in, in Liverpool. Charles McMunn, a little bit similar to uh, when I said about neuroanatomy uh, with Clark. Uh, this is all about spectrometry, not necessarily my forte. I, I did do A-level chemistry but it's getting further and further away now. Uh, but he was from Ireland and he came over to work in Wolverhampton. I think he had family there uh, and he was very interested in spectrometry. He would, uh, he had an eyepiece in his GP practice, which was part of his house. Uh, and he'd look through the eyepiece to see who the next patient was to decide whether or not uh, it was worth stopping his research to see that patient or to continue the research for longer and the patient to wait. Um, so it was all looking at uh, various parts of living tissues and the work that he did was all on histohematins um, as well as myohematins. Um, some of his work again wasn't th thoroughly accepted at the time. Um, it took sometimes uh, a few years after uh, for him to be linked to it because they realized over time what work he did was he was actually describing what was known as uh, cytochromes um, and uh, later led to mitochondria. Um, I'm not going to say much more from the chemistry on that point of view, but yeah, he was very much linked to, uh, to mitochondria uh, from his GP practice in Wolverhampton. So Patrick Manson, um, he um, was uh, always interested in uh, parasites and, and the like, apparently, so said his family, because when the family cat died when he was five, he, he was uh, found going through the cat's intestines looking for worms. Um, he also uh, was very good at remembering sermons, apparently. He was a GP, but he did actually work abroad as well. He, he did go over to, to China. Um, and whilst there, uh, the fil uh, filia parasite linked to, uh, I think, hookworms, 
uh, was known about, but not fully this, fully how it got how it was uh, transmitted. So he did work on the blood of uh, patients with with this parasite and found that it seems to only come out at night. It prefers cold uh, cold blood. So he was the one who postulated it could be linked to the brown mosquito. He went back to England because he wanted to do more research and, and get his uh, credentials up a little bit. Um, and he decided that he, he had to stop doing some of, some of his GP. He said, men like myself in general practice are but poor and very slow investigators, crippled as we are with the necessity of making our daily bread. Um, so he ended up uh, changing from general practice to go full on um, tropical medicine. And he went back to China uh, and it was mainly with work on uh, malaria that he did. He nearly got the whole cycle uh, worked out by by himself, but his work was thought to be uh, to lead to Ronald Ross to finally solve the life cycle of a malaria parasite. He kept on going between England and uh, and China, and so when back in England, he very much campaigned for a tropical uh, medicine um, uh, hospital. Um, so uh, the one in London, uh, he did did help create. It is also very thought, highly thought of in China because he, he did start the um, start a medical school, I think actually in Hong Kong. Um, and in his, one of their early graduates was uh, the, the first president of, of China, um, I think from about 1911. Um, I would get it wrong way around. Um, and I mention this because around about the eight, 1890s, um, the later to be president, uh, was arrested in the embassy, the Chinese embassy in England, uh, because the uh, feudal dynasty were, were, were after him. Uh, but Manson, uh, together with someone else, uh, did help uh, cause him to escape, uh, and because he knew of him uh, as one of his very high ranking medical students. Um, and he later became president of China and the whole Chinese system changed. But I will I'm digress a little bit. Uh, so James McKenzie, he was a Scottish GP um, from Scotland who uh, became a GP in Burnley. Um, he, in his early part of his GP career, he did realise that all the stuff that he'd been learning at medical school, uh, all to do with the disease at the end of its journey, let's say, uh, didn't really prepare him for when he's seeing diseases from the beginning. Uh, so he started metac meticulously re uh, documenting what he saw so that he could follow the disease over time. He was also very interested in cardiology. He had his own polygraph, which was a forerunner to the ECG. Um, but he did lots and lots of documentation over, I think it was over 40 years that he, he was a GP for in total. He was the first one to describe certain arrhythmias like extra systoles. Um, he was the first one to realize electrically what atrial fibrillation was, uh, those A waves on the, the polygraphs. And he published a number of books that were, were very popular um, there was some research that was debated, however. Um, he thought atrial fibrillation was caused by the vagus nerve, whereas um, um, Lewis, um, who was one of the cardiologists in London and who also had, uh, who was also editor of, of a cardiology journal, he thought it was from the AVN. Uh, there's quite a bit of arguments between them for a while, but they became friends. And I mention it because I'm led to believe my wife's great great grandfather was was Lewis, uh, so I had a bit of interest when doing that uh, chapter. Um, he he did become a cardiologist for a while just to help with uh, getting a bit of credentials and getting his cardiology work published. But 1919. He, uh, he founded the St. Andrews Institute of Clinical Research for helping GPs do more research uh, themselves. And he, he went back to doing GP work as well. But uh, he did lead to uh, various careers uh, after him because of the work that he did. Um, and that was Mackenzie, who did a lot with cardiology. Um, another Scottish GP. Um, I've written quite a bit on this slide just to remind me because uh, it's quite hard to remember this part. Um, but Francis Adams, um, he, he was a GP also for over 42 years, uh, stayed in the uh, same town, uh, Bankery, hope it's pronounced that way. Um, but he, he did over 10 hours a day doing uh, Latin and Greek. That was his big thing. He was, he was offered the chair of the uh, University of Aberdeen, for example, which he turned down because he wanted to keep on doing his GP work and just do 10 hours of his own research all the time. But he did lots of research of, of the original texts 
such as the nervous system of Galen, uh, the seven books of Paulus Aginata, if that's pronounced right. Professor Charles Singer was the most eminent medical historian at the time, and he rated the translations as the finest venture in pure historical medical research in the English language. He did lots more translations, which, uh, which are written here, and uh, uh, no doubt in my book if you were to want to look in that, but I'll just pass over the rest of him. But yes, a, a GP uh, famed for, uh, for uh, ancient languages. Someone else involved in literature, uh, who uh, no doubt you've heard of, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, Conan taken uh, after his maternal uncle, um, and he was also his godfather. Uh, he went to the University of, Ed of Edinburgh, and during during his time there, he did spend seven months on SS Hope as as the medic on there. Uh, he later uh, wrote how grateful he was that people were so well, considering he was a third year medical student. I also mention it because uh, his diaries of his time on 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 that ship uh, were actually published something like 126 years later. Um, so the most recent uh, Conan Doyle publication was based on his time as a medical student. When in Edinburgh, he did work under Joseph Bell, who he was, he was in awe of because Bell was, was uh, known to be able to tell the occupation of a patient merely by looking at them and without the patient saying anything. And obviously he, uh, he used this skill uh, with his uh, main character who I'll mention shortly. He became a GP down in South Sea. Um, not rumoured to have had the most successful GP career. Uh, he, he wasn't known to have lots of patients and sometimes the medicine maybe not as strong. Uh, maybe because he didn't have many patients was why he perhaps uh, did started doing more writing because he had done some publications as a medical student, I should have said. So he wrote, he wrote to Beaton's Christmas uh, Annual in 1887 uh, and it was published and it was called A Study in Scarlet. And this was the first one to ever feature Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. There's only 11 known copies of this. And I think it was 2007 when um, one of them went up for sale and it was around about 150,000 uh, US dollars making it the most expensive um, magazine of all time at that time. Um, so he was paid 25 pounds for this, uh, for giving the rights up of that. He ended up doing uh, four books and 56 short stories. Um, he retrained as an ophthalmologist. He went to Vienna for that. Um, and during the Boer War, he, he did much campaigning, particularly for the water supplies of, of, the, of the doctors. The ophthalmology bit was quite relevant because um, there was a George Idelagi um, who uh, was uh, up in court. Um, and uh, Doyle, uh, got his eye measurements and all the, the optician, uh, ophthalmology sort of things that, that, that were needed because he, he realised and he, he wrote to the BMJ and it was all published. He said, do you really think that a man with this eyesight really could do the crime? I think it was a burglary and maybe a murder um, uh, at, in the dark of night. Uh, and it all led to them realising, oh yeah, he couldn't possibly with that, with that eyesight. And he was pardoned. And in, in, in the history world, this was one of the reasons I think why uh, the Court of Appeals in England and Wales got created. Um, I'm going to say that he's a keen sportsman. Well, was a keen sportsman. He, um, yeah, he played in 10 first class cricket matches and he got one wicket, which is certain WG Grace, who I'm going to mention shortly as well. Uh, he also played in goal for Portsmouth. Uh, so that was the, the life and times of Conan Doyle. Jonathan Couch also got published, a uh, very different topic. Uh, he, his dad was a fish merchant and he grew up in Cornwall, but uh, Couch was always very interested in fish, so ichthyology, the study of fish. Um, he, uh, he, he's very much known in, in the pilchard world for uh, doing much research, research on the pilchard. Um, and he did write four volume illustrated history of the fishes of the British islands. Uh, he drew every single one of the 256 illustrations, which are very impressive. Um, I have seen them. Uh, and the government even uh, consulted him about the behaviours of fish. Uh, he then did lots of work about the geology of Cornwall and uh, local trades. So very much uh, a Southwest uh, man, but uh, very high up in, in the fish world. Uh, more literature, a different type, uh, Gideon Mantell. Um, he came across Parkinson, I think in the 1820s, 
um, and was very impressed with Parkinson's interest in fossils and because uh, Parkinson had also written about uh, fossils. Uh, he couldn't afford uh, the books, but uh, was given some. And he, he himself became really interested in, in paleopathology there, but also paleontology, it should be. Um, he was walking in, uh, uh, in a forest in Sussex uh, when his wife actually uh, discovered uh, some fossils. Uh, and there were some, some teeth bones. Um, he knew about the iguana uh, reptile from, from other work and thought it bore a close resemblance. And over time, more and more of the bones got discovered uh, and more iguanodons, as they were later known, uh, were discovered. But it was uh, Mantel, or maybe his wife really, uh, who uh, discovered it. He ended up uh, publishing 67 books about various reptiles, again, testing my pronunciation, the uh, Hylosaurus, Pelorosaurus, Regnosaurus, and Telurepton algenens. I definitely didn't come across those uh, when my children were a bit younger. Um, but uh, he, he also did a lot of work on geology, uh, especially uh, of, of uh, Sussex and the Southeast. Um, he'd always wanted a museum. So his GP practice, um, there were two buildings, one for his fossils, one for his, uh, his GP work. And he campaigned to get more money to have bigger buildings and a museum all to do with fossils. He never got enough dosh from the... Uh, from the places he applied for, but on on his death, he did donate twenty to thirty thousand uh, fossils to the British Museum. Uh, and that's um, another Scotsman on this occasion, uh, Henry Folds. Um, he was a religious man uh, and was involved in a mission to Japan, uh, where he did stay for quite a number of years. Uh, this was with the United Presbyterian Church of Scotland. Uh, he was involved in uh, forming a medical school over there, as well as uh, a hospital. Uh, he took an interest in ancient Japanese pottery and realised well, there was a lot of finger marks on these. And he did some more local, more research and he realised fingerprints were individual. Uh, whether or not others knew about that at the time is, is for debate, which I'll mention shortly. Uh, but he thought that he was the first person to uh, realise that fingerprints were, were unique. I started working out what this would be useful for. And there's two cases in Japan that he was involved in. Uh, one of them was a friend who had been accused of uh, burglary, uh, but by using knowledge about fingerprints that he presented, um, his friend was, uh, was pardoned. Um, and also a member of staff at the hospital was caught siphoning the alcohol from a lab uh, based on fingerprints. So Folds wrote all these things up and uh, the topic up. Uh, he got in touch with Darwin, which a lot of people seem to do at that time. Darwin's cousin uh, was a certain uh, Galton, uh, being a surname, uh, who had various interests in lots of things. Um, it's rumoured because there's also Sir William Herschel who said that he'd been using fingerprints when over in India from like 10 years before. There's a lot of arguments between Herschel and Galton and Folds to exactly who the first person was. Uh, in the end, it seemed that Herschel and Galton uh, got together just to try and push Folds out of the argument. Uh, Folds was very bitter about this. He did lots of campaigning to Winston Churchill, for example, because when Galton got made a sir, he was like, well, what about me? I'm the one who did it. Um, and he's, he's very much known as the Forgotten Scot. Uh, but yeah, he was an interesting character. Uh, John Rhodes, um, he was born in Manchester, he went to Glasgow Medical School, but then the family went back to Manchester, and uh, he, um, he worked at the Chorlton Workhouse. In those days, when he was working, it was a voluntary job. Um, you know, the areas didn't actually have to have a GP, because uh, the law had changed in about the 1830s. Uh, but he was very interested in, in, in helping the poor. Uh, he did various research. It all led up to him becoming local, then national, then international conferences, all to do with poverty and his research. For example, he went over to New, New York and compared the slums in New York to the slums in Manchester. He realised that the subgroup of the Jewish population seemed to have the lowest infant mortality amongst the poor and realised how it might have been linked to breastfeeding. Uh, he did work on how many calories there should be per person in the, uh, in the work, workhouse. Uh, he uh, was the first to introduce nurses to the workhouses in the north. Uh, Nightingale had obviously suggested that you'd be unsurprised a few years earlier. Uh, but yeah, he introduced uh, nurses to the workhouse. 
Um, he splits epileptic patients and certain learning disability patients apart, realizing that they needed uh, different environments and uh, lives to those in the workhouse and was involved in building many houses. Uh, they were called colonies, but they really centers the modern world uh, for, for such patients. Um, he also, for, for orphans, he did, he did help uh, create uh, lots of care homes as well. Um, and he was very fondly remembered. He, uh, he lived in Didsbury, uh, nearby to Chorlton, and uh, he's one of not many doctors who've got pubs named after him. Um, another one was John Snow, actually, who we've mentioned. Um, he's also got a statue uh, of him uh, after he died uh, in Didsbury as well. So he did much work with the poor. Someone who wouldn't be very well known at all uh, is William Close, but I was just so impressed with uh, the sort of things that he got up to. Um, he was very much interested in the occupations of his uh, his uh, patients and would, would follow them around. Um, so he went to the mines. Um, he came up with new designs for lamps that were taken on. Uh, he came up with some sand tampering uh, technique uh, to help the miners. He came up with a pump, which there's a picture of here, which helped uh, uh, get rid of pints of water an hour. Uh, but he was also very interested in brass instruments. Um, at the time, there weren't valves, um, and by changing the size and length of instruments, you could change the notes. But he came up with a drainage spittlecock idea because a lot of um, brass instrument players, I believe, uh, had to use a lipping technique to try and change the amount of notes that they could do. And there's a lot of moisture getting created in the instrument. So he came up with the uh, spittlecock. He also designed various uh, types of trumpets himself, not with valves, but with little holes in, I think uh, there's a certain word for it, polyphonian. Um, and he got in touch with various bands and uh, musicians about it. Um, and many in the music world believe he should be remembered much more fondly or better remembered, I should say, for what he did. He also did a lot of local history writing and he came up with various new designs for inks as well, but he wasn't very well known. Uh, from his time working up in uh, Barrow, Barrow area in, in Cumbria. I'm going to mention WG Grace. Um, I am a chairman of a cricket team, so uh, I'm always going to be interested in the cricketers. Uh, but he was very much known as the first international sports star. Uh, even though images of him in later life were not very kind, well, they're probably true because of his uh, ever higher BMI. But as a youngster, he was excellent at a huge amount of sports, including sprinting and uh, rowing and hurdling, etc. Uh, but he, he always wanted to be a cricketer, but his chances were quite low initially because he was born in Gloucestershire and Gloucestershire wasn't a uh, first class county in the cricket field, uh, cricket world. He, also, his dad was a GP and uh, country doctors were not thought high enough in society to uh, warrant uh, membership of the MCC or to family members of. Uh, so he couldn't get into the MCC, the custodians of the uh, cricket world. And so it was only going to be by uh, performances that he would get in and he certainly performed well. Um, the chapter on Grace mentions a lot more facts than on here, but uh, he was the first one to uh, make 2000 runs in a season. He was the first to do the double of a thousand runs a season as well as a hundred wickets, which he ended up doing eight times in total. Um, he was first to get a triple century. Uh, test matches had been played abroad in Australia, but he played in the first test match in England. But he was doing some medicine, apparently. Uh, it took him over 11 years to qualify. Um, uh, and he wasn't one to be keen on books. He even told some of his cricket colleagues not to read because it might affect their eyesight uh, to play cricket. Uh, but he did finally qualify. Uh, his medical career was a little bit mixed, they mentioned. Um, he did take on the poor law, law officer in Bristol, which I think his dad had also done. Uh, but they weren't keen on him going off to Australia to play for six months uh, and have a very expensive locum um, as uh, one of the things. Some people also thought he was quite defensive at inquests. Um, but some more positive things that apparently he did um, there was a cricketer who got injured on some railings when fielding, who got a huge gash uh, to his neck, which uh, Grace was involved in helping stem the flow of. There's also the Kent wicketkeeper, Richard Palmer, who got an eye injury, which uh, Grace stitched up. Unfortunately for Grace, it was uh, Palmer who later stumped him in the match. And uh, Grace, not one for being keen on getting out, did uh, rumble about all the things that I've done for you and this is what you do for me. 
Um, um, uh, but there was also uh, near to his work in Bristol uh, a gas leak accident once, and again because of his sprinting and uh, interest, he did get there first and uh, was very commended for what he did there. Uh, he left general practice in 1899 to become the manager of the London County Cricket Club. Uh, he kept on playing uh, even longer than his son's careers, who were also first-class cricketers. Um, his last match was around about 1914-15, when um, he, he wasn't very impressed that the uh, Zeppelins were flying over in the war. Uh, and people said, why? Because uh, you know, you're used to find facing fast bowling. Uh, going at your head. But he says, at least I could see those buggers coming. Uh, can't see these these coming. Uh, so that was W.G. Grace, known in Victorian circles as, uh, as an international sports star, but he was a GP as well. So that, that was mainly the one, the GPs who were um, uh, from the uh, first, well, from before the 20th century. I then went on to talk about GPs from 1900 to 1950. Uh, and then there's a separate section about 1950 to 1967, uh, because various things happened in those times, and then 1967 to the modern day. Uh, I'm going to look at the clock. Uh, I think I'll probably start quickening up a little bit. And when I said earlier about uh, just picking out a few of these, uh, because uh, I'm conscious that uh, you may indeed uh, want to get on another bottle of wine or or whatever you want to do on a Friday evening. So I'm not, I'm just going to skip through a few of these until, until I mention a few. I'll mention Lachlan Grant. Um, he was a GP uh, from uh, high up in, uh, in Scotland, Bala Um He uh, was the doctor for some mines um, and quarries, sorry. Uh, and he wasn't impressed with the accommodation that was being provided. So uh, he, com he complained, he got sacked, and then all the workers supported the doctor and said, we're not gonna start working until Grant gets his job back. Uh, he was also involved in creating the Highlands Crofters and Cotters Association, and he was quite outspoken. Um, uh, so there was, in 1911, 1912, there was this Dewar report, and Grant was interviewed quite uh, extensively for this, uh, and Grant's opinions on what should be happening for the, uh, uh, medical provision of the, uh, the Isles of Scotland. Um, and his suggestion bore a, a big uh, resemblance to what, uh, what the NHS ended up being, or to do with being free for access and everyone having the same rights and everything. Uh, the Highlands and Islands Medical Service was created um, and um, what was very uh, well received. Um, someone who was on the admin of this service ended up being involved with the beverage report back in the 1940s when the NHS was getting created and the Highlands and Islands Medical Service helped by Grant was very much uh, suggested as the one and only pilot that uh, the NHS could copy. Similarly, uh, Alexander MacLeod, he was uh, a GP uh, in North Uist. Uh, again, I hope the pronunciation is okay. Um, and this is for 16 islands. He was working for the Highlands and Islands Medical Service. But he was involved in uh, the Reverend, Reverend Gillies, uh, who was dying. Uh, he helped campaign and to raise money for an ambulance, air ambulance to, uh, to, to bring him back. This is a photo of the uh, air ambulance uh, bringing back uh, Reverend Gillies. And it led to the uh, so first air ambulance service ever, ever used. And it was the Outer Hebrides Air Ambulance. And McLeod, he was also very heavily involved with informing the NHS uh, creators about the service and uh, free access and all, all, all that. So uh, he was an impressive man. I'm going to pass through G Harry Dane, even though I'm a Birmingham graduate and uh, uh, he was uh, a GP in Selyoak. So I was aware of some, some parts of Selyoak named after him. Um, on this occasion, I'm going to pass by Collings. He was an Australian uh, who uh, looked at various GP practices in the early 50s and basically condemned what was happening and did lead to uh, a lot of change, uh, education and quality of premises, for example. But I am going to mention William Pickles. Uh, uh, I actually went to the same school as Pickles uh, in Leeds, so uh, I've got a bit of a soft spot for him. Uh, and also because he uh, worked in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, so mentioning uh, from before Mackenzie uh, suggesting about uh, onward research and documenting your own patient records, this stimulated Pickles to do the same 
and there was a outbreak of jaundice in the Dales in October 1928. Pickles kept a record of all these as well as uh, following up and finding even more sufferers and uh, he was able to work out the incubation period of this disease. It ended up being uh, known as uh, hepatitis A but uh, it was Pickles who was the first one uh, to describe it. And he, did, he did various things in the epidemiological world. Uh, he was offered uh, a ministerial uh, epidemiology which he turned down because he wanted to continue uh, being a GP in, in A's Gaff. He, uh, he was one of the first to document epidemic myalgia also known as Bornholm disease which is uh, from a Coxsackie I think B, uh, B disease. Uh, and he, he did a book that was very popular about epidemiology in country practice. Uh, he was also the first president of the Royal College of GPs uh, 1952 time. Um, I'm going to pass through Sykes, even though he did do History of Anesthesia, which I used his book quite a lot with some of my research. I will mention Charlotte uh, Nash uh, because, because of a York link. Um, she uh, was the first lady ever to, first ever female GP to get published, uh, and it was all to do with breastfeeding. Um, she, she did research uh, using her patients. Uh, she found out how quite a lot of patients with reduced feeding uh, perhaps had subclinical hypothyroidism. She's the first one who, uh, in the history, uh, or believed to be, to do weekly clinics for mothers and babies, as well as father uh, clubs as well. Um, medical students from Leeds started coming to, to see her work, but she had a GP practice in York. I've never been able to find out which one. I even got in touch with the uh, estate agents of the same name. And I was quite close at one stage, uh, speaking through, through them and uh, family members, but I was never able to find out exactly where her general practice was. So another reason why i uh, fond of her uh, and what she did was because she had a big interest in motor racing. Uh, the picture on the bottom, she's on the right, and Janet Vaughan, who's also a doctor, was on the left. And they were the first uh, British ladies to ever win uh, the Monte Coup de Dam, um, so a race in, uh, in Monte Carlo. Um, and what happened was during the race, they, they were doing really well time-wise, but some Danish competitors had an accident and there was a broken leg and various other injuries. So they stopped the, stopped the race, uh, not their race, whilst the race went, uh, went ahead. And they were involved in treating these uh, fellow competitors, losing quite a lot of time themselves. But they got back in the car and they won it uh, in terms of the fastest female time. Uh, and a year later, she did some racing on her own as well. And she, she, won, a, she won an RAC race, for example. So uh, I want to mention her for various reasons. Uh, I'll pass by uh, Ethel Williams quite quickly, uh, other than she was very highly involved in the suffragette movement. Um, and she was the first lady in the north of England to own a car in 1906. Very well used by the uh, suffragette movement in the northeast for her campaigning. Uh, again, more information in the book. Uh, Baroness Summerskill um, did much uh, with the uh, political world. She, she was one of not many female MPs in the uh, mid to late 1930s and onwards. Um, and she did various things in the war, especially with the Ministry of Food. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to pass by just a, there's not going to be many more, but uh, I'll just mention uh, Janai Lal Katyal. Um, he was from India and he was a member of uh, Krishna Menon's India League who were campaigning for Indian self-rule. Uh, but he set up GP practice uh, in the Docklands of London. Uh, but when uh, Mahatma Gandhi came to England for the second round table conference in 1931, he very much wanted to stay amongst the poor. And it was Katyal who helped organize this. Uh, Charlie Chaplin was filming nearby and who also uh, uh, was doing much campaigning for the poor uh, and wanted to meet Gandhi. So Katyal sorted all this and this photo Katyal's in the top left, um, Chaplin's in the middle and Gandhi's to uh, Chaplin's left, um, was, was, was taken at uh, Katyal's house. Um, but Katyal ended up being the first man to, uh, his practice became the first one to, to make a health centre. It was in Finsbury in like about 1937, 1938. And he was also the Britain's first mayor of South East Asian origin. So that's Katyal. I'll just see how many more. We're going to pass by Cronin, who uh, did much literary work after getting ill, uh, caused his GP career to end a bit early, but many Hollywood blockbusters. Uh, Louis Neal, uh, very much involved in the music world uh, and uh, creating various orchestras. 
I will mention Ran Lowry very quickly. Um, he was uh, a GP. He did lots of uh, rowing with a certain Jack Wilson. They won various uh, boat races at Cambridge. They did similar jobs for the uh, government in Sudan, which stopped their rowing career for quite a while. But back in uh, when they came back uh, in 1948, they won a regatta, which helped uh, select them for the uh, for the Olympics, uh, and they won Olympic gold. So. Uh, he, uh, he then went into medicine afterwards and he was a GP in Oxfordshire. But uh, yeah, uh, a GP with uh, Olympic gold. There are a few others as well uh, who also get mentioned. Uh, some are still living. But I just mentioned, because this, this, one of his children was Hugh Laurie, uh, the actor. And uh, apparently when uh, Hugh was 12, they went into a rowing boat just on a normal lake or pond. Uh, lake, I suppose. And uh, Hugh had to make sure that his dad could actually do this. He was like, Skeptical, Is he sure he can do this because uh, Ran had never even told his son about his Olympic achievements. And Hugh later found in the loft the actual gold medal as well. Uh, I think um, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a lot of political stuff that happens with the creation of the RCGP. Um, and actually, yeah, I'm going to stop there, other than just link to the modern day um because i know it's uh prince philip's funeral uh tomorrow uh but he was actually uh, uh president of the royal college of gps for a year in 1972 obviously he did it jointly with a, with a gp at the same time uh and he was an honorary fellow but i had this picture uh so i just thought i'd mention it linking it to uh, what's happening in the modern world today so i'm gonna say hopefully uh, hopefully that's been of interest um I know there's various facts and just going through biographies, but um, uh, there are more characters which uh, I could always do another time, maybe the more modern ones. But uh, for, for today, I'm going to stop there and uh, thank you very much for listening and for inviting me to, to talk about it uh, and uh, uh, talk about my book to a degree. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to say stop, share and see all your faces. Well, Neil, thank you. Oh, you're still there. Oh, so I thought you might have headed off. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, and dear Neil, Neil, that was a, a fascinating talk, and I I know there was Pleasure. a lot left unsaid. So, um, um, you you did mention you'd be happy to um, answer a few questions that people have got. Certainly, really? um, perhaps I can kick off. Um, I'm just intrigued. I I was never formally taught about the history of medicine at medical school, and you mentioned that you had been involved with hymns, you're currently involved with Manchester, but hymns stopped it. I, I just wonder how you would make the case for the history of medicine to the to a very crowded timetable, a very crowded curriculum uh, at medical school. I mean, I get yeah, yeah. it, but, but I mean, how, how would you... Um, well, I don't want to be big headed for a second, but I did actually do a research paper on uh, why history of medicine should be in the uh, curriculum of medical schools. Um, it was it was in I think the Royal Society of Medicine journal. Um, so I did a, I, I did actually interview um, all the history of medicine leads for undergraduates. I think 15 medical schools out of the then 27, 28, about 10 years ago. Uh, did offer history of medicine at undergraduate level. So I did a sort of qualitative piece. Uh, I think there's a few quantitative things in there. So there's various arguments along the lines of, uh, you, know, you need to learn about history to avoid the mistakes that have happened in the past, um, helps develop writing skills. Uh, obviously when taking histories from medical, uh, from patients, you know, uh, delving into their past and their occupation has, has importance. Um, Obviously, the old ward rounds having certain surgical names, uh, normally surgical, attached to signs and things. Um, I remember being at medical school and doing the old fashioned wearing lab coat, following the consultant around and suddenly, oh, stethoscope. Who invented a stethoscope? And uh, not many of us knew it was Lenek at the time. But just, and just little facts like that. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of reasons. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, presented in a paper which... Uh, will be getting dust somewhere. Actually, I've got a copy in here, to be honest, but uh, I won't bore you with that now. Mm. Very interesting. Um, I've got a hand raised from Nick Bosenkay, perhaps, Sarah, if you could... Uh... Yes. 
I've yeah. very generously allowed everyone to unmute themselves, sure. but I okay. would like them to um, wait to be asked before they start speaking. Right. <laughs> okay, can, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Very good lecture. The, the only thing I'd add was that um, Snow was his first apprenticeship before a Pateley Bridge was in fact with the Stevenson family doctor in Newcastle. Mm. And I think it would be fascinating to find out how much he learned from the great engineering innovations going on at that time, which may well have been his influence, this great innovation of uh, ways of measuring uh, ether, ether, first ether, then chloroform, which were, uh, but before that, they just sort of uh, released a cloud and hoped that it would work. Yeah. And, uh, and also, will get it as well. Yeah. Also, it may have may have caused something of his interest in pumps. Yeah, yeah, good point. But that's partly why I always liked uh, that era. Anyway, a you can find out the information well, compared with if you wanted to study ancient uh, well, ophthalmology in ancient Egypt, you're going to have to learn hieroglyphics and maybe travel to Egypt. Whereas uh, if you're doing about Victorian medicine, particularly in the United Kingdom. There are the journals out there, like I mentioned Wakely already, and we heard about British Medical Journal from the last time, uh, previous meeting to this. Uh, so you can get the information. Um, and it wasn't that long ago, but long ago as well, to be different. But everyone, uh, all the different ideas that they were passing around in, in the Industrial Revolution, uh, the conditions that were getting created. Um, I just think it's, it's one of my favourite eras in with anaesthetics, because anaesthetics, modern anaesthetics started in 1846. Yeah. That was why I knew I could get the research done because you can find it. He's so buried. In, things. He's buried in Brompton Cemetery in London, and the American Society of Anaesthetists uh, says that it's uh, maintaining his grave, but it's not in a very good state. So uh, if, perhaps we can lobby them. But he also he wrote a. Uh, a lecture on, um, which is a strong prohibitionist, a lecture on uh, how the good citizens of Pateley Bridge basically owe their good health to the enormously pure water that was flowing through. I always had my own working in Pateley Bridge because uh, that was often a start of many family walks when I was growing up and uh, a very good pot pie from there as well. Um, so uh, I can believe that was uh, a good place to live, definitely. Thanks. I think uh, I think York did do something about snow recently. Um, I think, was there a new sign put up? And yes, there, there's a more, circles or there's a, 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 a replica of the pump just by the yeah. by the by the river um, near um, Rougier Street, near North Street, in fact. Yeah, from his, uh, oh. from his birth. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I I think we might have to. Uh, Bring the questions to a halt now as in fact we're, we are running on a little bit but um, um, perhaps I can now pass over to uh, uh, John Reed, who's going to give uh, the uh, vote of thanks for this evening. Neil thank you very much for a, 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 an interesting evening. Um, as a retired GP we all probably like to think we're noticeable but that's really in our own surgeries presented some fascinating vignettes of uh, people who are genuinely notable going back over uh, several hundred years. I didn't really realise that general practice went back to about 1714 uh, and I was interested in a lot of the, the history. They used to say that medicine or they said that medicine really wasn't effective until around the Second World War but actually there was an awful lot of work done to uh, form the basis of a lot of modern medicine going back from GPs who are obviously uh, a lot of polymaths out there, and uh, mm -hmm. um, I think it was um, quite interesting. Picking up about John Snow, the Medical Society did actually um, contribute to the, um, um, the, 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 the pump, uh, the um, uh, replica of the, the, the pump there on North Street, and I was um, the president when it was actually um, unveiled. Mm -hmm. I, I was there at the um, unveiling of it. Um, in terms of one or two of the names you mentioned, I will just say that... Uh, I, I was fascinated to hear about Hugh Owen Thomas. Um, my orator, unfortunately, ended up in a Thomas splint last week oh. uh, for 24 hours. Uh, I commented that it may well have been life-saving, particularly in the First World War, but it's the most uncomfortable thing that he's ever had to wear. 
and every movement was painful because uh, he had um, his femur was rubbing uh, with these uh, two his broken uh, bones together. So it was uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, interesting there. Um, but I think that you've given us a, a fascinating talk. I'm sure there's a lot more you could have said. Um, and it's obviously, sorry that we weren't able to hear about some of the more modern uh, uh, notable GPs, because I'm sure there's an awful lot of those, but uh, uh, there's a lot of work gone into that. And I'd like to thank you for a great presentation this evening. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Sure. No, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, thank you. So um, moving on, we have item six, any other business. Uh, I would just like to raise at this point, we've got a, an AGM coming up and we've got a couple of resignations from the board. So um, we are looking for uh, applicants to join the board just to bring